Hey there, welcome back. Today we have a little library book haul. You can see I've got a bit of a hefty little stack here of one, two, three, four, five library books that I currently have checked out that I want to share with you. So we will have some lovely, relaxing book sounds for those of you who like that and a little bit of rambling and I won't go into too in-depth a review on any of these books we'll just kind of do an overview of them but you will see that here on the bottom of my stack I have Ruthless Vows by Rebecca Ross which is the sequel to a book I did a fuller review on, Divine Rivals, and so if you are interested in knowing what I thought of that sequel, stick around or skip ahead. I will put timestamps for all the different books, and I'll let you know what I thought of that one. Okay, my stack is getting a little heavy. So I will put it down, but I did want you to get a little preview of what we have in store. And I did want to start out by saying, before we dive into the books, I wanted to say thank you to all of you, because yesterday I was feeling a little stuck in my creativity. I kind of couldn't think of what I wanted my next... ASMR video to be, and usually I have kind of a running list of ideas in my head, and I do, you know, have some ideas in the cooker that are always there, but I just didn't really feel the spark of what I wanted to do next, so I asked all of you in a post on the community tab, and you sure did deliver. You gave me a lot of really cool ideas, which I'm going to be filming over the next period of time, so all of your requests will get a video. So I just wanted to say thank you to everyone, and the very first suggestion that I got was for some book sounds and or a book haul. And I had thought about doing that because I had this group of books out from the library, but I've done a fair bit of book-themed ASMR lately over the past couple of months, and part of me was like, oh, maybe they're sick of the book stuff. Maybe I should, you know, not overdo that, but I know at least one of you wanted some more, so I decided to take that as a sign that I should share these books with you. So let's dive in. This paperback has a very nice tone. This tome has a nice tone, in my opinion. And all of the books in this haul, I didn't really realize it until I sat down with them. They all kind of have a theme around writing and writers which is kind of cool. One of them maybe is a little bit of a stretch to fit in there, but I think I can make it work. So this first book, and I'm just going in the order that I had them in my stack, which is kind of how they looked nice aesthetically, I thought. So this is a bit random. But the first book I have here is Bird by Bird. 
by Anne Lamott. And this is a pretty well-known book about writing, a book for writers, which I had never read before. The subtitle of it is Some Instructions on Writing and Life. And last spring, I read Anne Lamott's book, Almost Everything, Notes on Hope. And it's a wonderful book. I actually did a review of it on this channel. I'll link to that below. And it really helped me when I was going through a tough time. Very inspiring and... I just love the way Anne Lamott writes because she is a very hopeful and inspiring writer, but she does not sugarcoat things. <laughs> She's very realistic about the tough parts of life and the struggles that we are all up against, and I just love the way she writes with great tenderness and respect and humor about the human experience. So, I think of all the books in my stack, this is the one I have just started on. I'm only a little ways into this one. But I'm really enjoying it. They are basically short little essays about the craft of writing. And in the beginning, she basically lays out that she is going to share with the reader everything she knows about writing and what she teaches in her classes, and it's very practical advice. She kind of starts out by talking about how if your goal is to be published, if that's your overarching goal as a writer, then you will probably be disappointed because even if you are published, it will probably not fulfill you in the way that you think it will. And that there are other, more important reasons to be writing. And the title, Bird by Bird, she, I'm sure she'll probably explain it in this book, but she actually referenced it in almost everything. She said that once when she was a child, her brother was supposed to write some sort of report for school on birds and he had put it off until the last minute and he was upset and stressed and so her father, who was a writer, a professional writer, sat her brother down and gave him some sort of encyclopedia type reference book about birds and said, okay buddy, you just gotta start writing. Go bird by bird. And that is at the crux of a lot of her advice on writing, is to just keep at it, to make it a part of your life and who you are, and express yourself with courage and with vulnerability. And be who you are through the written word. So like I said, I'm only a few chapters into this, but I am enjoying it very much. It was published in 1994, and if you have read this book, or you're a fan of Anne Lamott and her work, please let me know. She has a lot of books of essays and perspectives, and I'm kind of beginning to work my way through her writing. So, I thought this would be a good place to start. I got all of these books from Interlibrary Loan at my library because my teeny tiny small local library just got hooked into the big regional system and I can now pick up Interlibrary Loans at my local library, which is like five minutes from my house instead of having to go to the bigger library that is in a town about 20 minutes away. So I just feel like I now have the world of books at my fingertips. 
very excited. So that's number one. We'll put Anne Lamott to the side. So the next book I have is another instructional book about writing. Oh, this one has a nice sound. And this is a beautiful book. I love this cover design and the blue edges of the pages. This is the Norton Centenary Edition of, it's a little covered up by the library sticker here, of Letters to a Young Poet by Reiner Maria Rilke. And I hope that I am pronouncing his name properly. I looked up a couple sources on that to try to be as accurate as I could. And Rilke was a poet in the late 19th and early 20th century, a poet and writer. He was from Austria and wrote in German and in French. And the reason I checked out this book is because his poetry has been following me around the last six months or so, all the way back to when I read Margaret Atwood's newest collection of poetry called Dearly. I also did a review of on this channel. I will link to that as well. Kind of didn't realize how many connections I had going here to my past book videos. But she has a poem in that book about zombies, interestingly enough, that starts with a quote from Rilke. And so I had to look up that quotation and um, the poem that it was from. And then ever since then, I just keep seeing references to Rilke's poetry in all sorts of different places. And that's kind of how I am with poetry and what I read. I love poetry. I love to read poetry and write poetry, but I'm not a scholar of poetry. That's something I'm a little bit self-conscious about sometimes, actually, that I consider myself a lover of poetry, but I don't think I'm extensively well-read in poetry. I certainly don't have an exhaustive knowledge of poetry. And the way I've usually, usually explored poetry in my life is I read poets that appear to me when someone suggests them or they start showing up in my life, which this isn't the first time this has happened with a poet. So I went into Interlibrary Loan and looked at what books were available and decided to start with this one because it's a good sticky sound. I had seen a lot of lovely quotations from this book. And it says on the back of here, a gorgeous edition of one of the most beloved classics of the 20th century. So these are actually letters. They are not poems. These are letters that were written by Rilke. And I actually looked this up. They were written in 1903 and 1904. And they are letters that he wrote to a young student who had sought his advice about writing poetry and asking Rilke if he thought the poetry, if the young man's poetry was any good and how he should go about getting published and what advice he could offer on how to be successful as a poet. And so it's a series of letters that he wrote back to this young man, and they're just really lovely. 
there is definitely a theme of looking into one's self for validity and not trying to seek confirmation of one's skill or worth from outside sources, which is a similar theme to Bird by Bird as well. I think that's generally some wise advice for writers in general to not write for any kind of outside accolades, but to write because you have the desire to do so deep inside you. And there are a lot of themes in this book about life and death and divinity, and it's just very, very inspiring. So I'm only about halfway through this one, and if you look up Letters to a Young Poet quotations, if you search for that, you will find a lot of inspiring words. But I did mark a couple of pages here, and I think I will need to buy this book because I already have the urge to be underlining tons of things, you know, with my pencil, which of course I'm not going to do in a library book. But let me see, since I didn't mark these, if I can find what I wanted to share. A line that really stood out to me was this. A work of art is good if it has sprung from necessity. And I find that to be very true in my own creative life the things that I am most proud of, that I have written, or that I have created, are things that I created because I felt that I had to. I felt a strong need to create. I felt very compelled to put whatever it was down into words, or into art, or out into the world, or in the case of this channel, out into a video. I think I created this channel from necessity, because I needed a place to share my voice, and I had this desire and this creativity that was bubbling up in me and needed an outlet and could not be stopped. So that's why I created this channel. So I really like that line, a work of art is good if it has sprung from necessity. And then I'm also going to flip to one more page which I think this is one of the better-known quotations from this book. And he says, I want to beg you as much as I can, dear sir, to be patient toward all that is unsolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves like locked rooms and like books that are written in a very foreign tongue. Do not now seek the answers, which cannot be given you, because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then, gradually, without noticing it, live along some distant day into the answer. And as a person who finds that I live with a lot of questions about myself and about the world. I really like that sentiment. So I think this is a wonderful book for anyone who is a writer or a creative of any kind. And I am definitely going to dive into reading more of his poetry and do a little study of Rainer Maria Rilke this spring and summer, I think, and this seemed like a good place to start. Okay, so there we go, another book about writing. Okay, this next book isn't exactly a book about writing, but it is a book that is very much about creativity, and excellence, and paving your own way, 
and not being afraid to stand out from the crowd, which I think are all important elements for any writer or creative person. And this is Jonathan Livingston Seagull, a story by Richard Bach with photographs by Russell Munson. And I saw this book on the shelf at my library and I immediately had a flashback to high school. I had not thought about this book in years, but I read this book in high school when I was in a very nerdy book club with a group of fellow students who would read books just for sheer pleasure, books beyond what we were being required to read for school. And we would get together at lunchtime in the library with our librarian and discuss them. Shout out to Mrs. Rowan, my high school librarian, who was a really cool person and facilitated that group. We read a lot of excellent books in that group, including Midnight Hour Encores by Bruce Brooks, which I also did a reading of the first chapter of that book in a video once. This really is quite thematic and connected to my other videos. I didn't realize that as much until I got started here. But Jonathan Livingston Seagull is a book a story. It is a story. It's not very long. I mean, you could sit down and read this probably in like an hour or a little more. And it is a story about a seagull named Jonathan Livingston Seagull. And this is a highly allegorical story. It is a sort of a mythical tale about this seagull who is not content to just live his life flying in the typical seagull way and hunting for food and being part of a flock. He wants to test the limits of how seagulls can fly. He wants to fly faster and higher and in more complex ways than any seagull has flown before. And because he is not adhering to the typical seagull societal standards, he is persecuted, not surprisingly. And there are a lot of levels and layers and stages to the story, and it becomes very philosophical and spiritual, and there are elements of the afterlife, life and death, and what happens to us when we leave this world, and what is the nature of excellence and success, and what does it mean to rebel against the society that you are part of in search of greatness. And there is a lot packed into this trippy little story. I believe it was published in 1970, and it definitely has a very 70s feel to it. Yes, 1970. It is dedicated to the real Jonathan Siegel, who lives within us all. And the back says, This book is a new and valuable citizen in the very wondrous world ruled by the little prince. I suspect all of us who visit the worlds of Jonathan Seagull will never want to return. So that might give you an idea if you're a fan of the little prince how this is sort of a similar story with a lot of 
symbolism and a lot to consider. And I remember when we read it in high school and our little group having a lot of deep philosophical conversations about what we thought it was about. And there are also a lot of photographs in this book of seagulls throughout the book. So those are also interesting to look at. Like I said, there are a lot of photos in this book. It's not that long of a book, but it's a book that you will want to read slowly and savor and really contemplate as you read it. So I hadn't read this book in, gosh, almost 30 years, I guess. And so it was really a pleasure to pick it up again and see what I thought of it as an adult rather than a teenager. And I would highly recommend it if you're in a contemplative mood to ponder the meaning of life and would like something to help you do that. So, Jonathan Livingston Seagull. Okay, so now we are going to totally switch gears here to a very sassy and irreverent contemporary book that was published in 2019. And I usually try to keep things pretty G-rated on this channel, but this title does have an expletive in it, so I will say it the Irish way so that we can keep things clean on here. This book is called By Yourself, The Fecking Lilies. It is by Tara Schuster, and she is a very, very funny writer. She was a writer for Comedy Central before she became a full-time author. This was like a breakout book for her and launched her writing career. And the subtitle is called, um, so, By Yourself, The Effing Lilies and Other Rituals to Fix Your Life from Someone Who's Been There. And I will admit, I picked up this book. This is actually the second time I've checked it out of the library. I'll tell you why. But the first time I checked it out, it was sitting on display in the library in a display of self-care books. It was self-care month. And that was a time when I was in a pretty low place back in the winter, and maybe it was in December, and December or January, and I was feeling pretty low, and that's back when I was having a lot of panic attacks and anxious feelings, and the title made me laugh, of course, and I just thought, you know, this is kind of symbolic of what I need to do. I need to do some nice things for myself. And the title of this book is basically, you know, she's encouraging you to do that special thing for yourself that makes you happy, whether that's buying lilies or some other way to bring beauty and pleasure into your life for yourself. And so, you know, she does have a very irreverent style of writing. She is an old millennial, as she puts it. And so, you know, she does use some colorful language in this book. So if that's not really your thing, that might turn you off a little. But it's very funny and very vulnerable, very vulnerable and very well written. It's like sitting down with a friend and them just kind of dishing to you about their experience. And she writes about her childhood and her growing up, which was very chaotic. Her parents were 
very eccentric people and did not really take care of her very well. They had a lot of mental health issues themselves and she just was kind of neglected and left to fend for herself a lot as a kid. And so this story is about her sort of coming to a point in her mid-twenties when she wanted to take care of herself and take control of her life and start healing some of her old wounds and move past her addictions and her self-doubt and a lot of the things that had been harming her in her life experience. And I was really inspired by this book because she talks about giving up cannabis, which she had used for many years, and that's something that I relate to in my experience. And she made me feel really proud that I have also beaten addictions to things that I was using in my life to numb things out and hide away from my feelings. And the other reason I really like this book is because she talks a lot about writing and journaling as a tool for self-awareness and self-love and self-healing. So she goes through a lot of different techniques in this book for kind of getting yourself together and investing time in self-care for your body and your mind and your spirit. And it's just a really fun read. And it was very inspiring to me. And the reason I checked it out of the library a second time was because I actually wanted to write down some of the journaling prompts that she had mentioned in the book because she has a lot of good ideas around that. She actually has a sub-stack where she shares writing prompts and she's kind of made that into her living, kind of being a teacher of writing and journaling, which is pretty cool. So if you're looking for something fun, I mean, there are some heavy-ish parts in it because like I said, she went through some pretty intense stuff in her childhood. Not exactly abuse, but just weird parenting by people who didn't really know how to take care of themselves and so weren't very good at taking care of their children. But she has really been resilient in her life and overcome a lot of that. And this book is like sitting down with a friend and having them share their best tips with you. And it did help me to laugh and lift myself up a little bit out of the funk that I had been in at the time when I first read it. And so I was grateful to Tara Schuster for that. So, that is this book. Okay, we'll move on to the last one now. This is for any of you who are waiting for my review of the sequel to Divine Rivals. This is Ruthless Vows by Rebecca Ross, and I will link to my review of the first book in this duology, which I had gotten as one of my blind dates with a book from my local library. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this book because it's hard to talk about a sequel um, to a book without giving away a lot about the books, especially if you haven't read the first book. So I think if you want to read these books and you don't want to know anything about them, then skip this, don't listen to this part. I'll try not to give too much away. But I did just want to overall say that I did enjoy this book. I enjoyed 
both books more than I thought I would for a romance fantasy. I thought they were good, as I had shared in my first review. Sometimes romance novels kind of get on my nerves a little bit with all the back and forth and people not expressing their true feelings and misunderstandings and things like that. But this is really more of kind of an action drama romance, and particularly this second book has kind of a like secret agent, double agent, spy kind of a feeling to it, because our male protagonist, Roman, has been captured by the enemy and the conflict that is taking place in these books, and he has lost his memory. I will share that part because that's pretty clear from the beginning. And so he is trying to remember who he is and determine where his loyalties lie and what side of this conflict he wants to be on. And throughout the book, he is remembering and reconnecting with Iris, who is his love. And I really did enjoy it. And one of the things I enjoyed the most was that in the first book, these two characters, one of the cruxes of the plot is that they can communicate through magical letters that reach each other magically, not through the post. And in the first book, Divine Rivals, Roman is aware that it is Iris who is writing to him, but she doesn't know that it's him she is writing to. And then that kind of gets flipped in this book. Since Roman has lost his memory, he doesn't know that it's Iris writing to him at first, but of course she knows it's him. So it's kind of neat how the author flipped that around for this book. And this is a book about a war and conflict, so there, there is some battle and some violence. It's nothing overt or graphic, but be aware that that is part of this book. But there are just a lot of good characters and a lot of good relationships. And I do like the way that she developed the story. In the second novel, we get a lot more of the divine element of the two gods who are in conflict in this story, and I did enjoy it. I will say my two criticisms are that towards the end, there were a few things that I felt like didn't quite match up and wrap up my satisfaction. I would have a few questions for the author about, no, wait a minute, if this person knew this, then why didn't they know this other thing, and how did this all fit together? So I'm picky when it comes to that kind of stuff in books, but overall I enjoyed it enough um, that I can overlook those things. And then the other thing, this might be a strange criticism, I felt that the actual romantic, physically intimate scenes in this book, of which there were not many, it's definitely not that kind of a romance novel, but I felt like they were a little bit overly sanitized. Like, this is a married couple, and they have been separated in war, and have both gone through a lot, and in the times that they are able to be with each other, I don't know. I just, I didn't feel those scenes as viscerally as kind of I wanted to. So I don't know if that's because this is considered a young adult novel. I mean, the characters are adults. They are of age. And they are married, like I said. And you know, not that I expected it to be super steamy or anything, but I don't know. It just didn't 
stir me in a way that I thought was in line with the intensity of the storyline and what the characters had been through. So I don't know if that makes sense. But it was an interesting conclusion to this storyline, and I will say that Iris, our female heroine, she definitely is the hero of the story. She's the one that does the saving and does the courageous things and stands up against the villain and saves the day. So that was cool. That was a cool element. And overall, these two books, they weren't like, you know, oh my gosh, these are my favorite books and I'm going to read all the Rebecca Ross books now or anything like that. But they were a good winter distraction. They were entertaining. And like I said, I really enjoyed a lot of the secondary characters and the general arc of the plot. I would say my one other complaint, <laughs> I'm getting really picky, aren't I? Is that sometimes with this sort of book, it makes me think of, if you're a fan of the Harry Potter books, when I got to the end of Harry Potter and I kind of had to have that moment of like, okay, I know this is a book about war and battle and like, it wouldn't be realistic if none of the main characters died. But I think sometimes I had to ask myself with Harry Potter, did all of these people really need to get killed? Hmm. Did all these characters really need to meet their demise at the end of the book? I'm not sure. And I kind of felt that way about this book too. There were a couple of characters that I was kind of like, eh, I think you could have let them live. <laughs> so, not giving away too much in that regard. But, overall, I did enjoy Ruthless Vows by Rebecca Ross. So, that was my library book haul. I'll come back to Anne Lamott since this book has a different kind of a sound. Maybe I talked too much and didn't do enough book type sounds, but at any rate, I hope you enjoyed this. Thanks for hanging out with me. Let me know if you've read any of these books or what you are reading these days, if there's anything you would recommend to me. And thanks as always for being here with me. So take good care of yourself, rest well, and I'll see you again soon.